Hello everyone and welcome. I'm here to speak to Thomas Keneally and Eleanor Catton, both former winners of the Booker Prize, in fact current winners of the Booker Prize we should say, always winners of the Booker Prize. Um, and we're speaking as part of the Big Jubilee Read celebrations. I'm sure you know what that is, but if you don't, the Big Jubilee Read is a Reading for Pleasure campaign celebrating great books from across the Commonwealth to coincide with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Um, an expert panel of librarians, booksellers, literature specialists um, have chosen 70 books from, that, that's 10 books for each decade of the Queen's reign, um, and it offers some absolutely brilliant, globally various choices, I think, very unexpected in, in some cases. Um, but we're very proud here at the Booker Prize um, to say that 21 of those choices, 21 out of 70 are Booker Prize books, so winners or shortlistees or longlistees, and 31 of them are Booker Prize authors, so not necessarily for that book, but, but those authors. Um, interesting, given that the, the Booker has only existed since 1969, and obviously that's not 70 years. Um, the Big Jubilee Read is delivered by the national charity, The Reading Agency, in partnership with BBC Arts, you can find out more about it uh, at bbc.co.uk slash arts. Uh, and it's also supported by the Arts Council England and Libraries Connected, the Booksellers Association, and in partnership with Libraries Connected East Midlands. Right, after all that, I think we can, <laughs> I think we can begin. Um, you will know of uh, Thomas Keneally as the author of Schindler's Ark, um, which became the film Schindler's List. I believe it was also published as Schindler's List in the US. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, uh, and many, many other books. Uh, and in fact, I think Schindler was your 16th book, or there were 16 books that came before it and, and many, many more afterwards. Um, three prior book of shortlistings, The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, um, Confederates and Gossip from the Forest. And uh, Eleanor Catton, you will know as the author of The Luminaries, which won the Man Booker Prize in 2013. She was the author before that of, and remains the author of The Rehearsal. And she has a, a book coming out next year called Burnham Wood. Uh, she has also written, well, adapted The Luminaries for the BBC, that six part TV series, and has adapted Emma uh, for, for film. So we'll be talking about all of that. I hope, adaptation and, and writing and reading. Um, so, but before we get on to the, the nitty gritty of, of writing those books, which I hope you'll remember for the benefit of our audience, um, can you say a little bit about the effect of, of winning the Booker Prize? Um, Tom, do, do you want to start? Well, thank you, because I won the Booker Prize, if winning's the word, I had it handed to me more, <laughs> more accurately, uh, before Eleanor was born. And uh, this uh, puts me in my place. 1982, I was in my 40s. I'd written out of conviction a strange book uh, that was a form of faction or documentary novel. It was described uh, and registered in, in the, uh, by, uh, for the authorities in Britain and the US and Australia as a novel, uh, and yet it had also very much the, the qualities of, say, Tom Wolfe's In Cold Blood. I could <laughs> not, <laughs> yes, uh, and I, I could not write it any other way since the survivors I'd interviewed uh, didn't want it published in other, on any other terms. And thus I was bound by the very characters to get it as accurate as I could and to rewrite it on their request. Uh, and uh, it was on that basis that the interviews had been taken uh, and they were very nervous that both deniers and their own people who hadn't encountered any um, uh, anyone like Schindler, their own survivors, uh, would uh, contradict, pick up on contradictions in the text. And uh, so I had a, 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 a very important duty to make it real. And thus, on the basis that it was like in Cold Blood, also described as fiction, I uh, amazingly... Um, 
won this prize. Admittedly, it is one of the great stories I've ever encountered. <clears throat> it owed none of its complexity to me. The story owned me. I didn't own the story, but it was written very much at the request of Schindler survivors. And of I, Yes. Can I interrupt you to, to just tell people who might not know who Schindler was and, and what that story is? He worked for Abwehr, German military intelligence. He was part of their Ostrovo office in northern uh, Moravia, right on the border with Poland. It was natural that come the war, he would go to Krakow. And in Krakow, he began to uh, amass his fortune and at the same time uh, to shelter his prisoners. I don't know whether he ever sheltered them for his wealth's sake, but there was certainly a symbiotic and very hard to define relationship, very ambiguous relationship with these survivors. And that's the story the book set out to tell. Uh, I had, as a seminarian in the Catholic Church in the 1950s, my ancestors were Irish, and so uh, I was a, a, a papist seminarian in Australia, and I uh, became very interested in the connection between uh, Judaism and Catholicism. So I was set up to be interested in, in this topic in a lay way. And also, in, uh, on top of that, my father was a soldier for three years in North Africa. And he stayed on in the Middle East after, even after uh, most of the Australians left to face the Japanese. And so he uh, uh, was um, uh, used to send me memorabilia in cake tins, uh, <laughs> Nazi detritus from the battlefields of Adam Halfa, Benghazi, of uh, El Alamein. And uh, so I inherited all this material as a little boy of six or seven. What did that, you do with it? Well, it gave me a, a, an abiding interest in the Reich, to tell you the truth. People say how weird uh, that an Australian would write this book. And I like to say, well, I was only one degree of separation from the regime. My father was the one that was in contact. I was one degree off it. And that was the beginning of my interest in anti-Semitism, which I never got. Now, we Aussies and, and uh, our New Zealand uh, uh, talented person here tonight <laughs> will confirm that we Aussies are the roughnecks of the South Seas. And it always amazed me that our betters, the metropolitan Europeans, people with PhDs, people of cultivation could be stricken with a strange hysteria. And uh, not that we were angels. Uh, one should just look at the history of Aboriginal people in Australia, but the particularly organized attempt to extinguish Due to the Jewish strain from European civilization, as if it was a virus that could not be allowed to live side by side with it. That fascinated me, and that my metropolitan betters should be stricken by this hysteria, too. Um, and so I wanted to write about that. I could say more, but we're not hearing from the <laughs> from the the new, new zealander, zealander. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, no, i mean it's 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 very interesting that you you say all that uh my novel the luminaries is set in the 1860s in new zealand during one of new zealand's uh gold rushes and when i started researching this this part of the south island hokitika the town of hokitika where the where the novel is set i was so astonished by how multicultural uh this this place became and in fact one of the the first places of worship that was built in Hokitika in the in the mid 1860s was a synagogue um which is which is very interesting now I mean I don't think that there are um 
there are there, there are that many Jewish people in New Zealand. Um, uh, yeah, so it's 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 it was it was a fascinating research um, process really to go back and discover this this cosmopolitan, very multicultural, um, cross pollinating past. Um, and you're and you're the beautiful. only one, uh, other than uh, a, a great old um, uh, writer called Terry Hume. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. oh, oh no, you're the only one that's written about uh, uh, the New World gold rushes, which oh, did okay. bring everyone, didn't they? They brought the Cantonese, the Cantonese rebels. They brought uh, uh, European who had participated in the uprisings of 1848. They brought a fascinating mix of peoples, which we're uh, now trying to revive in the new world or bring yeah, back. Yeah, it was very interesting. My research, I, I kind of translated a lot of what I was finding into formal um, uh, pledges to myself, I suppose. So I, I, I really wanted to um, see if I could write a a 19th century novel, a kind of one of those big um, kind of brassy, um, kind of Dostoevsky and kind of 19th century novel. Um, but it, it struck me when I was reading a lot of uh, 19th century novels in, in preparation for writing the book that um, uh, quite a, a high degree of um, education was, was assumed on the part of the reader. So there would be often uh, untranslated passages of French or Russian or, or German. Um, there was there was quite a kind of high bar in terms of cultural entry. And so I made a, a decision uh, to myself that I wanted to, um, in my book, have untranslated Cantonese and Maori, so to, to, to uh, at the time, more spoken languages, um, and uh, to have that as a kind of antipodean riposte, I suppose, to the to the 19th century of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh. Yes, that was... Uh, <laughs> now, another extraordinary book has been written in Hokitika or in its environs, another Booker Prize-winning book by Terry Hume. Right, yeah. And uh, who was uh, a part Maori woman whom I met in Hokitika, and all the best people come from that northwest... Uh, <laughs> coast of the South, South Island that you write about, which is where you had this extraordinary uh, collection of races brought in by auriferous enthusiasm. Uh, and you, um, uh, you, you haven't ever got that, quite got that back in New Zealand, have you? Nearly. It's it, it's, uh, no, I, don't, I don't say that as a condemnation of New Zealand, but as a matter of, matter of comment. Uh, I, I think in Australia, we have the new voices from Chinese writers, from, uh, uh, from writers from all over the Middle East uh, and the subcontinent, uh, like, like England and... Um, I'm pleased that that's happening, but your your book is a, a wonderful look at a uh, New Zealand without borders, as it was in the 1860s. <laughs> uh, well, yes, but we should also be careful not to be too um, complimentary, I suppose, because there was um, as it, that's very specifically with regard to the. Um, uh, Chinese immigrants to New Zealand at that point, there was just absolutely shocking um, double standards, horrible, horrible treatment that is um, in, in a way kind of yet to be formally uh, apologised for or <laughs> mm. <laughs> reparations are, are yet to be made. Um, so yes, and here that has happened, but only because our Chinese population is so large. But even our historians wrote about that period. Uh, our historians and your historians wrote about those gold rushes as if the uh, Chinese were subsidiary characters. And the great thing is in a novel, they don't have to be. Uh, uh, you can uh, look at their full salience in detail. And uh, uh, yes. uh, I think I'm the first historian 
who's written about those gold fields and the Chinese and given any of them names. Uh, and that's purely because of the generation I now belong to. It's not through any special virtue or insight. Well, how fascinating. We Antipodeans are getting off on each other's weirdness. So we should have <laughs> another question. <laughs> well, I only have an introduction, so I do think that's fascinating. Um, you know, I, were you, I mean, just, just to finish off on that, were you aware of that, Ali, when you were writing it? And was that something you intended was to give um, people of different origins more space or more, more life? Yeah, well, in, in a way, um, the, with the liminaries, the, the formal preoccupations of the book came first in, in a sense. So um, I, was, I was really interested in, um, uh, well, one of my ambitions for the book was to, to try and write a book that was formally, structurally ornate, that had a, um, almost like a kind of an, an allegorical dimension to it, a, a, um, a, a superstructure in the sense that, each of the characters is modeled on one of the figures of, of classical astrology, so the, the figures of the classical heavens. So you have um, seven planetary characters who move in and out of the lives of 12 zodi zodiacal characters. And in plotting the, um, the, the book, I, I mean, it seems very bizarre to even explain it now. I kind of don't quite know what was going through my head at the time, but <laughs> I, I had the idea that what I could do was to um, uh, generate star maps of what was really happening in the skies over Hokitika during the year, um, the, the years of the gold rush, and plot the book exactly onto what, what was really happening up in the sky. So if, if Mars moved from Cancer into um, uh, Leo, then my um, Mars character would move from having something to do with the um, Cancerian character in the book to something to do with the Leo character. Um, so it sounds very batty, and it, and it was. That's great. Um, I remember we spoke about this at the time. Do you remember just after you'd won? And yeah. Um, I mean, actually, the experience of reading it isn't isn't as complex as that suggests. Oh, no, right? yes, so, yeah, I'm probably so. making it sound very, um, very kind of top heavy and cumbersome. Um, but it's, it's fast. Uh, sorry, because no, don't mean to interrupt. I was going to say, actually, because it would be good to talk about research. And I, I suppose in your case, there's the Zodiac, I mean, that's partly research, partly this sort of formal concern. I mean, you're doing research in the service of this idea, right? But then there's the research into the gold rush. And then, I mean, th there must've been all sorts of other, I mean, other things you'd have to research as, oh, the 19th century novel. I mean, that in itself, because if you read the rehearsal, your previous book, it's written in a completely different style. It's about a sort of sex, a teenage sex scandal, the performance of, a, of, of that. Um, very layered, but very immediate and sort of in the, um, yes, in, in a lot of it in the tone of voice of teenagers, let's say, um, mm -hmm. contemporary teenagers and not, uh, and, and then you pick this book up, which is not only set in the 19th century, but um, I mean, I'm going to say that impersonates a 19th century novel that doesn't seem quite right because it's its own thing it's not a, it's not a um pastiche oh, I like I like but... impersonates <laughs> <laughs> well it's 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 not a pastiche but it is it you know it honors that in its style as well as uh, in its subject and so so much research must have gone into that and on so many different fronts so perhaps I've, I've interrupted you on the zodiac but I, I want you to carry on but in that sort of may, maybe thinking about the other uh, whole ev everything that went into it I suppose yeah, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think that research, research can both, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's crucial, but it can also um, kill a book, I think, if you kind of get too, <laughs> get, get, get too lost in, yeah. in, in what it is that you're finding. There, there has to be a, a certain point where you, you put it all, put it all aside. Um, I, I think that for me, the, the role that research plays is to build up a sense of authority on my subject matter actually it's to make me feel like I can um, I can change uh, uh, I, can, I can change things I can I can use some things and not others um, and it's 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 more to do with confidence really than anything else um, to yeah to feel like I have the right to um, um, the, the right to invent really I think that that that, that comes out of um, that comes out of research definitely. And were you were there particular books you were reading at the time? And when you say nineteenth-century novels, were there some in particular that? 
you had oh, in yeah, I mean, I, I, I read a lot. I tried to read a lot from the early 19th century to kind of get a sense of what my my characters would have read mm. um, and and how they would have thought. Um, but then I, I suppose uh, books like um, The Brothers Karamazov and Anna Karenina, which I think are, are a, little, a little bit later, both a little bit later, um, were, were you know, hugely influential. Um, yeah, I think I, there, there's something about the the kind of the moral project of the 19th century novel that I really, um, that, that just just really speaks to me. And I, I think that one, one thing that's very interesting about New Zealand as, as a, a national literature is that it, it, it kind of begins with modernism. It wasn't really until, until Catherine Mansfield started writing in the 20th century that there was anything like a kind of a New Zealand literature. And it took many, many decades after that before people um, felt like they could even talk about such a thing as New Zealand literature without um, cringing <laughs> or, or, you know, feeling embarrassed or, or whatever. Um, but modernism is such an interesting place to start, you know, because it, it is itself a reaction against a, a, a much more kind of established tradition. And so it was quite fun to try and write New Zealand back into a tradition that um, where, where it didn't really have a natural place. Well, that's uh, the term Australian literature was a uh, Dame Edna average one-liner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unfair. But that's, that's really interesting, Annie, because actually it's almost like you, a form of restitution, but, but also given, given back with this, what you were describing, the very sort of ornate uh, structure, which almost, we, it, it's not that it comes from modernism, but it has a, an element of that, an right, interesting right. form that comes from modernism, but is sort of replanted in the, the soil of, of the 19th century somehow. Is that, is that? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, when you're writing books that are set in the past or you or making use of past um, uh, traditions or, or forms or whatever, um, you always have to remember that your reader is in the present and will only ever be in the present. Um, you're, you're not writing for a reader in the past. And so I think that you, you kind of have to keep both um, both questions alive in your mind in a way. You, you, like how, how do I speak to the re reader in the present while also kind of um, doing something interesting with, <laughs> with all this? With all this over here <laughs> in the past. Yeah. Do you want to, before we get back, back to, um, well, back to Shinto, um, do, do you want to say, I interrupted you when you were speaking about the, the, the zodiac and the, the composition. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Because it's quite a oh, fascinating structure. Yeah, so um, it, in a way, it, actually, it came out of, um, a, as often happens with me, it, come, it came out of a, a kind of a, a, a negative reading experience rather than a positive one. I'd, I had become really interested in tarot cards um, and was learning how to read them and, and, and just was very fascinated with them. And with the the idea of astrology as a kind of a, a kind of primitive psychology, this um, uh, circular uh, system of 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 really kind of emotional principles, each answering the one that comes before and prefiguring the one that follows, um, that has been projected up into the sky for millennia um, by our ancestors and, and contains quite a lot of psychological, interesting psychological wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a kind of artifact, even though obviously it's not something that anybody will ever touch or um, say that they could, could have made. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was, really, I was really interested in all of that. And I read um, Italo Calvino's novel, The Castle of Cross Destinies, which he modeled on a, um, a tarot card spread. And I was just so bored by it. I, I thought that it was so, it was so. One of um, my favorite books. Oh no, no really, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, keep going. I'm, I'm just... no, that's very funny. Um, anyway. No, 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 keep going. Apologies, I won't give you a Only for the conceit and then you built on it. So um, yes, yeah, so I, I, well, what, 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 what bored me about it or what kind of frustrated me about it was that I, I found it very, um, I found it a very static book. Um, a book that, that that made you kind of sit back and and look at the whole think about the whole the the entire time but never gave you the kind of immediacy or engagement or immersion that that a um that, that a plot gives um it never kind of made you want to know what happens next um mm -hmm. it was it's a kind of a um 
an, an art gallery reading experience where I kind of I wanted a I wanted a movie theater reading experience I suppose and um, and so I that, that that really inspired me to to see whether I could write a, a book where the plot was formally ornate and baroque and and had a shape it had its own um, uh, music to it um, and yet um, it was it, it was a book where things happened where um, you know people got shot and slept with each other and you know <laughs> all, yeah, all that kind intrigue. of dastardly intrigue stuff yeah <laughs> yeah it's perfect it's, yeah I, 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 it's, it's brilliant and it's brilliant that it should have come from there actually because you can see that I, I can absolutely see the Saturday and in fact I wonder I, maybe I didn't I, I spotted this wrong but in the BBC series it struck me that the cards that Ida Wells is using are those Bonifacio Bembo cards or copies of them, something like that. No. Oh, right. Yeah. That, um, that, that, that probably would have been the set decorators um, inspiration. Yeah. Um, but that's yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Tom, on your research, I mean, you, you spoke um, you spoke about Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, right? And Trim Capote's In Cold Blood, I think. Um, as being inspirations for writing kind of faction or whatever we're going to call it or fiction non non-fiction mm -hmm. novels i think they were called in, in the states um yes and and the the idea that the the survivors wanted it to be accurate because well as you said both deniers and um their own cohort might not have believed it but that that suggests it, that it should be factual it doesn't necessarily suggest what you did with it which was to use all the devices of a novel to turn it into this great you know sort of I'm going to say fictional read this great work you know a great a great novel whether it's fiction or non-fiction um could you could you take us back a little bit to the very beginning of how, how you discovered this story and and the research that uh, you did? yes I uh, it, it's uncharacteristic of my other work in that it has a most magnificent plot. Um, what I was aware of the first uh, meeting I had with the survivor who introduced me to the material was that it overcame the problem that the imagination has with great numbers of dead. It said that Stalin uh, mentioned uh, six, uh, five million deaths as, or 10 million deaths of being a statistic during the Ukrainian uh, famine. And he counseled a uh, bureaucrat not to use the term tragedy of millions of deaths. He said one death is a tragedy, five or 10 million is, is a um, uh, statistic. And it is true of our imaginations that we can uh, uh, apply ourselves, our sensibility, our identification, with one victim at a time, but not with millions. Mm. And uh, the Schindler story, by its very nature, uh, had this strength that it acquainted us with every item on the Holocaust list, every event of the Holocaust, but through on an imaginable scale. Mm -hmm. And imagination has always been uh, the problem. Uh, and uh, I was attracted to it for that reason. Uh, I was convinced I couldn't write it because I was a Gentile. My Jewish friend, Leopold Pfefferberg, shouted, that's good, you have, no, you have no ax to grind. I'd never written a book quite like it, though, and I'd never, I felt very... Um, almost dealt out of it by the fact that we had nothing to do with the Holocaust until I began, you know, I, I thought back to my father's experience. I thought back to the fact that the Holocaust in a way goes on because even post-war, uh, we needed our refugees to be sponsored by the Jewish community. Mm. And they were the only refugees, displaced persons, as they were called, uh, on whom such an onus was placed. Mm. And so I'm, I, I was fascinated by the automatic and abiding anti-Semitism and 
wondered how it would be for me if I had by pure accident happened to be Jewish and a target, a target to this day in places like Hungary and Poland, where you would have thought the Nazis and various right-wing paramilitaries had done away with the problem. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I was fascinated as well by uh, Oscar being a bad Catholic. I was a bad Catholic by then too. I doubted the um, uh, transubstantia. I doubted every Christian doctrine there was, you name it. And um, uh, I was not enamored of the modern church either. Mm. I thought it straying into um, it straying into um, uh, uh, anti uh, into uh, birth control was a step too far. And indeed, most modern women didn't accept that. For the, for the ones who did, it was a tragedy. And uh, therefore, I uh, was interested about the automatic relation between Christianity and anti-Semitism. Now, while saying that there were notable Christians like Kurt Gerstein, who uh, was an SS chemical officer and who uh, used um, Zyklon B as an anti-mite, an anti-parasite purification chemical in mining camps. And then the SS took it up and used it to kill the Jews. But he, he was a um, whistleblower whose whistle never got listened to. Oscar was more effective in everything he did, even his whistleblowing, which is dealt with more in the book than in the film. And, and um, in any case, I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by the fact that he was a fairly primitive, reactive man, a, a, a primitive philosopher, re, re, reactive rather than self-reflective. Mm -hmm. The men and women who were dependent on him for salvation felt that he was nearly out of control, felt that he'd get himself shot, were scared he'd get himself shot. Mm -hmm. Oscar, don't do it. Don't bring in those dying people from outside the and fill your factory cellar because you're not supposed to have them. And uh, the, the issue of hairs raising on prison, the back of prison's heads uh, became a common description of what happened in that um, factory, that second factory, which was in Moravia and which is now opening again under the uh, auspices of the survivor of the original Jewish owners of that factory. Mm. Uh, and uh, so um, this idea of a man nearly out of control, a philosopher wasn't any good. A philosopher like Henri Bergson was good enough to die with, the, uh, with, with other Jews to uh, give up Catholicism and to give up his special protection and say, I'm going with my people. Mm. But uh, that was all the saint was good for in the Holocaust because it was such a system. It was designed to devour the, ineffect the saint as ineffectually as it devoured the victim. And you've got this wild man who is somehow, mm. my God, touched by divinities. Uh, Powers bigger than himself, as if, as if Jung's archetypes actually existed. He's bigger than himself, and he—you don't know what's driving him: money or peace, or certainly a desire not to want not to want to see people killed. He certainly had that desire. And um, the man who's taken over Oscar's factory as his ancestor's factory in Moravia uh, says that it was characteristic of Moravians to be very much at home with the unghettoized middle-class Jews of, uh, of Moravia. 
but that's still not. Uh, I found it fascinating that the world could be so upside down, that language can be so upside down. It's been upside down ever since. We've never got language back under control. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I remember during COVID, uh, politicians like yours uh, talked about victims uh, with a pre-existent condition, mm. which was a way of soothing our head and saying, don't worry about it, you know, it's okay, there, there we, you're not. No, I see. <laughs> and oh, well, uh, I think that's medically the sort of language use that's been going the round since the, uh, uh, since the Holocaust started, the fashion for insane, for calling things the reverse of what they are. You mean being Jewish is a pre-existing condition? And, and <laughs> so, but I didn't have, I envy Eleanor uh, for having such a complex pro uh, process. I have written since then books that are deliberately written in the, Elizabeth, in the uh, Victorian mode. Uh, most recently, a book uh, concerning Dickens' sons who were sent to Australia. I was fascinated that in the 19th century, not only were the convicts uh, uh, sent to Australia, and I've got loads of them, and my wife's got loads of them. They're Irish, you know, they just <laughs> rounded them up. Uh, any knuckle dragger they could find, anyhow. Not only convicts, but the children of gentry. And I wanted to write, in the case of Dickens' son, about, um, uh, about this fashion into which Dickens fell of sending his sons, the ones who weren't good at school, but were good at cricket and horses, uh, to Australia, and that it would redeem them as it redeems Micawber in Copperfield. So I had a, a few fancy notions like that running through uh, the Dickens boy in my most recent book, but when it comes to fancy notions, I'm afraid the ones I had were on the ideological plane and were consisted of a lot of amazement at anti-Semitism. Mm. I didn't think it was important enough to kill people for. Mm. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And then you... You, um, it's interesting that you should say you weren't sure you had the, the right to, to write it or you weren't the right person to write it. Yeah. I mean, how did you feel? Um, I mean, I think that The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, which is a, a wonderful book and was shortlisted for the booker as well. Shortlisted, yes. Um, how, I, I mean, how did you feel then about writing that story? And Well, no, I, I made that story entirely my own in the way that a, a novel becomes entirely one's own. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a written at a time when Aboriginal writers weren't writing mm -hmm. uh, yet. Uh, we have a whole string, and that story is now best left to them. But uh, I had a fierce sense that Aboriginal Australia had not moved between 1900, where the book is sent, and 19. 67 when I began writing it and when uh, the federal government was empowered to pass laws in favour of Aboriginal people. Only state parliaments had had it up to them and we didn't have the wit that the New Zealanders have to produce a unitary parliament. One parliament is as much trouble as any country needs and um, uh, therefore uh, uh, I um, uh, was aware that we were offering Aboriginals a future in which if they became like us, uh, they would become treated as we were. Right. But it hadn't quite arrived, you know. In my hometown, the Aboriginals were living in uh, settlements north and south of the town when I was a kid. They were survivors of a big tribe called the Thungudi, who is which has produced rugby, rugby league, and boxing world champions. But 
which when I was a little kid was probably at a nadir of ill health, dispossession, mm. bewilderment. Mm. Uh, I, I'm also fascinated by why the women are never as caught up by the men, are never as ashamed as the men, are never, never disabled by shame and dispossession as mm. the men are. And but but that's an another question. So uh, there, there we are. Um, but but I, I you see I tend to be um, attracted by social issues rather than I, I wish I was attracted by trying to <laughs> write in this kinky way that Eleanor has <laughs> up to, uh, of of having a definite plan that relates to the form of novel hmm. uh, that, that I think it works so well in, in her uh, work. Uh, and um, so um, there you go. Enough <laughs> said for the moment. The, the effect is brilliant, but they're, they're, not, they're not both like that. And I'd imagine your new book is not the same, I, you know, that you try something different each time, right? I mean, oh, yes, my, my yes. Yes. yes, I mean, not all of them have this, this ornate structure. But, but I tried to ornate. write, I tried to write in the English of the gentry, the English people wrote to each other in, mm. and that Plorn, uh, uh, Dickens' youngest son, uses to write his mail from Australia in, mm. because he has spent, he's grown up in, in a middle-class household, at least, if, a, a household of the gentry, and indeed of of a great human. Yeah, but well. an idiot too. He was an idiot. <laughs> Dickens. I have behaved in some circumstances better than Dickens did at the height of his life. <laughs> and the worst thing was the way he uh, abandoned his wife of ten children, and then uh, published that press release about their relationship saying that they were criminally ill-suited so even great men can be uh i'm trying to think of a word better than dickheads <laughs> it is. We'll, we'll take that we'll accept that thank you um i want to ask you both about bringing your books to the screen I mean, Ellie, in, in your case, actually, two, two things I want to ask you about. One, in your case, writing your own adaptation of your novel, but also um, adapting a classic novel. I mean, how did those two things compare? And, and what was it like to, to adapt the luminaries? Because, you know, it's very different in structure and focus, I suppose, isn't it, the, the series? So how, yeah. how did you arrive at that? Oh, I've, I've absolutely loved um, kind of swimming in the water of <laughs> screenwriting a little bit. It's It's given me such a new appreciation for the novel actually and all, all the things that the novel um, can do that that um, just cannot be done on 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 uh, on screen and, and and equally all the things that can be done on screen that the novel just ha has kind of no mm -hmm. um, there, there's no analogy there there's no kind of comparable um, effect um, on, on the page um, yeah, so my, my experience was that I started writing, I, I started adapting the luminaries, which was a very long process. Um, I, I adapted all six, um, I wrote all six episodes, which I think kind of looking back, I, I kind of re realized the folly in that. I think it was, it, was, it was a big project and I had a lot to learn. It was my first project. Um, and it was only when it was almost uh, a finished filming, actually, that I started working on Emma and that that, that oh, film... Awesome. Uh, the, the, they were actually um, uh, incredibly filmed at the same time, which was which was a um, <laughs> which was a lot at the time. Um, but looking back, I I now wish if if I have a kind of a regret about it, I almost wish that I had cut my teeth on adapting other people's work and then moved from there to adapting my own, um, because I, I I learned much more. It was it, it was much easier to see what I was learning on on the Emma project. I had a much firmer sense of um, my own relationship with the novel. Um, I, I adore that novel. I, I will um, defend it to the death. You know, I, I just think I think it's it's a um, it's a, a, a perfect book. And um, that confidence in it um, 
my, my love of the book made me able to see what was necessary and what was expendable, but kind of very, very, very simply. Um, whereas in the case of the luminaries, because I, I, I doubt it's, um, <laughs> it's worth, worth as a book kind of on every page, you know, I have, <laughs> I have such a, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't mean that kind of in too much of an extreme way, but it, I, I've seen it in, I've kind of, I've kind of seen it with its clothes off, you know, I've, I've seen it in, in, in its half finished state. And I remember all the scenes that were in it, in, in the novel before I realized they didn't work and they got cut. And, and so I've seen all of the, I've kind of seen behind the curtain. And I think that what that meant when it, when I, when it came to adaptation was that I, I was almost too willing to take it in any other direction. Um, yeah, so it was kind of, it was, it was, it was a very interesting, um, it was, it was a really interesting experience to be able to compare adapting somebody else's work and, and adapting my own. But I, I definitely found adapting other people's work much easier, um, partly because my feelings about it were um, so much less complicated, I suppose. And so there was so much less second guessing about is this really any good? You know, if, if somebody said, well, Forgive me. you know, is, is the Box Hill scene in Emma really that good of a scene? I will throw down the gauntlet. And I guess like, oh, yes, it is. You know, let me tell you why. Um, <laughs> whereas I think if that's, those same questions get asked about any one scene in the luminaries, I would think, well, I don't know, maybe it could be, maybe it could be a different way. Um, mm, that's interesting. Yeah. And when you say um, you realise what the novel could do, I mean, it's giving you a new appreciation for what what you can only do in a novel. That what what is that? Or do you, I mean, maybe it's too hard no, to say. But can you no, 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 no. Well, I think that the um, the on, on screen you're con constrained both in terms of space and in terms of time. So mm -hmm. on screen you can only ever look at one thing at once. Um, you're looking usually at the characters rather than through the characters' eyes. So you're you're, you're seeing them from the outside. Um, you're not you're not inside their heads and thinking as they are. Um, so you're constrained visually by the by the the, the limits of the the screen, and then you're usually constrained temporally as well because a, a film needs to be more or less two hours, and an hour of TV needs to be an hour of TV. Um, whereas in in a novel, both of those things are incredibly elastic. Um, any moment can um, drop into a memory in the course of a sentence and come back again. It can span um, kilometers. It can kind of, it can go, go across the world, go into the past and into the future. And there's a kind of a, um, there's a, a kind of a weave to, 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 to fiction writing that's more, it's, it, it has more in common with, with, with music in a way that it's a, um, you're, you're, you're creating a, a treble and a bass and a, and a, and, and a rhythm and there's there's a kind of a, a, a flex and a push and a pull to it um so so so, so much for the novel but on on the on the the screen side um I think that the the film has two great advantages over the over the novel that the novel just can't hope, hope to con uh, compare um one is that the uh, uh, film has a soundtrack um which is the, the, be, I think because in a novel, the entire um, experience is, is soundtrack in a way. It's <laughs> the, the, it's a um, e everything is being created by by, by the line. Um, you don't have that sense of being uh, pulled into the emotional reality of the person that you're you're watching on screen with with a like just like a really excellent score or a really fantastic um, uh, a, a piece of music um, and then the other great advantage I think that this, that screen has over the novel is that it has a cast <laughs> so you have you you just get the the privilege of being able to watch you know amazing and usually very good looking people <laughs> uh, just and, and the action is just uh... The action is just by force majeure. It, 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 it's uh, uh, simpler, isn't it? Yeah, no, it, 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 I think that's that's really true. In, that in, there novel, are, in novel terms, yeah. In novel terms, yeah. That there, it, It's not always a neat translation. That some, something that will work on the page often seems very 
clunky on screen and likewise something that that is just um extraordinary on screen you translate it back to the page and it seems kind of shallow or um or empty you know that that i think that the the, mm. the there are things that are lost in translation both ways um you're very lucky to be to be able to be a screenwriter because most of us don't have the musculature for it. We can't sacrifice our darlings sufficiently. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, it's a great way to earn money between novels. That's definitely true, yeah. I mean, <laughs> th th there's a lot of humility you have to learn. Um, of course, as a novel writer, you there are two things you don't have. You don't have a budget <laughs> you have to work to, and you don't have a schedule, which is very important in, when you're uh, filming that, I mean, it's a it's a live event. You know, you, all the actors' schedules have to um, uh, be able to fit together. And, and with shooting the luminaries, for example, we couldn't get beach access for such a long time because of the where it was something to do with the regulations and the tides and where when the summer fell. Or I, I don't even remember the details, but it meant that a lot of the scenes that I had written to take place on a beach had to be rewritten to take place elsewhere, which was which was quite difficult. Um, all, all sorts of things can come up um, that just have to do with the contingencies of the, like the, the, the difficulties of living in the world. Um, so it's kind of a, I don't know if this is petulance, but in my, my new book that's coming out next year, uh, in the very first sentence, there's an explosion <laughs> because I, I, I wanted to write something that uh, any producer would look at it and say, "This is too expensive. You have to, you have to write this out of the script. You know, we're, we're not letting you do this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, and in case we haven't said, that's called Burnham Wood, right? Next year, um, Tom, your experience with Spielberg must have been quite different. So you didn't write your own script. How did that? Uh, work? I I did to start with, oh, you did. and was sacked. I've been sacked <laughs> by the best. Uh, he told me at that stage that the average the average endurance of the bladder was an hour and a half, and I must get it down towards that. But at that stage, he was thinking of writing a, a, a thriller. Well, not not exactly a thriller, but he was going to have an equivalent of Inspector ja uh, uh, the Inspector in in uh, Javier. In Les Mis. Yes, that's right, oh, in yeah. Les Mis. And he, uh, uh, an SS man who was uniquely non-susceptible to Schindler's uh, extraordinary charm, considerable charm. And uh, uh, so I presented him with a far more documentary uh, uh, f far more uh, based on the events piece. And then he used uh, three other writers after myself, Kurt Lutke from out of Africa and so on. Um, the, the final script I can say was much closer to the original because it was documentary too, deliberately so to match the black and white of, uh, photography in in the film. Mm -hmm. I realize how many uh, areas of excellence there are crammed into the one film. I mean, for example, the editing, but also the, the, uh, the, the set, uh, the sound. Sound is a world unto itself. Uh, the consistency of lighting in a film seems miraculous to me. How do they m maintain it from day to day? Uh, I, I had a friend who recently made his own film and was approached by the, the lighting man who said, uh, are you happy with the lighting? And he said, why shouldn't I be? Uh, and indeed, he was making a film not being a trained director. Mm. And if the sound uh, man was happy if the lighting man was happy uh, if the uh, camera woman was, was was all set he would go with what they judged to be the and uh, he produced quite a good film but I think those you it's best to understand 
those mm. uh, extraordinary areas of excellence that come together so authentically. So authentically, indeed, that you don't notice it. The thing, when I was a kid, I never met, realized there was a score behind it all. The experience was so unitary. Mm. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, what is the remarkable talent of film. And uh, on the other hand, they have all the elbow room in the corporate jet, and we have it in the story. We can put in subplot. We don't. We don't have to put. Uh, I noticed the two two times in the uh, book. Uh, Spielberg in the film, rather. Spielberg was forced to submit to print to move things along, and when you have to use print in a film, you it is partly uh, 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 partly a surrender mm. to the time demands of the film. And it's never dramatic, of course. And so uh, you don't see, for example, Schindler go to the, um, to the Gauleiter of Moravia and present him with uh, a diamond and say, I've been thinking of your wife ever since I bought this diamond and uh, giving it, uh, managing to pass it off and saying, by the way, there's a an abandoned factory in my village. I'd like to use it for a... The establishment of that camp in Moravia, the first camp in Moravia, led to other small camps, uh, which probably saved the lives of uh, 20,000 young Germans and Jews who weren't, uh, uh, who came to the war and weren't in the sort of main area of the Holocaust around Auschwitz mm. and uh, around Mauthausen. And so uh, they survived. They were not subjected to the final massacre that they were supposed to be subjected to. And there's no room for this in the uh, uh, in no. the movie. And uh, similarly, his black market operations. When he takes over, he has a Jewish artist and a Jewish future Supreme Court judge uh, who, um, a, a very progressive one, one who wouldn't have voted for Netanyahu, but anyhow, one who um, forged papers for him. He would bring them papers that said were permission for various dealers to take booze and cigarettes and hams and even diamonds into Krakow. And he was a gangster uh, in many ways dealing in all those commodities, cognac. And uh, so that criminality of his, which scared the Jewish survivors who were all, who weren't sure at that stage they would be survivors, and who were all very solid middle-class people. They didn't approve of what he was doing at all. Yeah. And uh, therefore, uh, there's no room for that in in the film. So um, uh, that's why it's, it's so good that uh, Eleanor can uh, write film uh, because um, it, it is a one, it, it is a golden skill to have. I think of some of the scripts that Pinter wrote in his old age. Mm. And there were other novelists who wrote great, uh, great films in their uh, late, uh, later in their careers. And, um, uh, well, it is, it is the uni it is the universal art form. It is the daily munch of the human race, <laughs> yeah. which not all our novels are. <laughs> Can I ask you a, a couple of, um, 
last questions. I mean, one, given that we're talking about reading for pleasure here, or this is sort of in honour of reading for pleasure, um, could you could you each say how you, well, I suppose the reading that meant something to you, either as children or later on, or the, the, the books that have really, I suppose, uh, impacted on your lives? Well, I was really lucky when I was growing up. My my mum worked as a, a children's librarian. Oh. Um, well, she, she was an advisor for uh, uh, school libraries. Um, so I had a lot to do with schools and um, this is, so there were always books around. We were always going to the library to visit her. And um, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I kind of had a childhood surrounded by books really. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, were, there, there, there would be too many to name, but um, books like the, the, the Dr. Doolittle series or the um, Willard Price's adventure series, <laughs> um, uh, I, I just read and reread and reread, and I think that's it's the rereading of childhood that really, really kind of cements the 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 the, the connection in a way. Um, kind of getting getting to the point where you you're, you're anticipating um, what, what what's to come, and you're you're rereading it just to remind yourself of um, you know how how exquisitely it was put together. Um, so I think yeah, all all of the the books that I um, that I probably know the best are all are all children's novels. Hmm. Well, that's great. What a what a privilege in a way, you know, to have that in your life as a child. Yeah, actually, the, the, there's one New Zealand novel called the The Runaway Settlers, which is about um, uh, it's an absolutely fantastic um, novel about a, um, a a family who's a, a fleeing an abusive father, and so they change their name. The mother changes her name, and they they flee to New Zealand from. Uh, fr from Australia um, and it's set in the in the time that the luminaries is set and one of the characters actually goes off to the gold rushes at one point um, and uh, yeah it, I, I think I should probably reread it I bet I would be I would be astonished about how, mu how much filtered into my subconscious after having read that'd that be, <laughs> yeah that'd be interesting to know and Tom how about you well I grew up uh, in a uh, time of of great cultural insecurity here, yeah, you know, uh, the, the, we had such a bad name in the empire as the rough trade that we both relished it. And um, my father certainly lived up to it when he was a soldier in the Middle East, but he, uh, if, if reports of his behavior ever reached General Wavell, General Wavell, who himself was a poet, would have disapproved. Uh, we had all those great Australians go away because they felt that Australia wasn't the, the, the place where novels could happen. Mm. Could an Australian write a novel? If you did normal English at school, it was all Englishmen and Irishmen and Irishwomen and Englishwomen. Scots, of course, uh, the great Scott, uh, Sir Walter. Uh, and so I grew up on Ivanhoe, on Fennimore Cooper, hmm. on those English uh, uh, comic books that had stories that were 5,000 words long in them called Rock Fist Rogan and Spider Web and the, the Upper Fourth and all all that stuff. I'd read about schools that just didn't exist in us <laughs> and about <laughs> snowstorms. And so I grew up thinking, well, our job is not to, is to beat the English at cricket and participate in foreign wars and grow wool, but can we write a novel? And it was on the cusp of that that I, I wrote my first novel. But we, you know, uh, a great talent who went away to Britain was Peter Porter, the poet, mm. wonderful poet. And um, um, he uh, was a, a soul in exile. And you write differently when you're a soul in exile. Mm. Uh, and then in the 70s, suddenly we had people writing full time. We had the craft of letters. We began to fancy ourselves. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, when, uh, when the Booker Prize was won, 
that was considered an indicator of our importance. And there have been three of uh, uh, Booker Prize winners from Australia, the extraordinary Peter Carey, who I think is a genius, and the wonderful Richard Flanagan, the descendant of Irish convicts, by the way, just like Rick and Eagley. So look what you did. <laughs> oh, <you> judges. <laughs> well, that was going to be my last question because we, we sort of began with what effect had the Booker Prize had, but then we, then we moved on to much more interesting things. But but actually, you know, it would be interesting to know how how that has affected your lives personally, if if at all, and and in particular whether it affected what you went on to write or how you felt about writing later on. It did. Did I found it hard to make an impact since it, or in modern times with works that I think are quite good, but I've known other aged uh, uh, writers who think that their work is quite good and they're unreliable witnesses. <laughs> uh, and uh, therefore it, it was a lucky chance that brought me that prize. It uh, gave later uh, various uh, English folk uh, a reason to read later works. And as for the works written in my antiquity, I'm now 86. Well, we can, we can leave those to, uh, uh, to um, uh, for, for, for one hopes reassessment. But uh, it, it, it does, as well as being an unalloyed good, it does tend, particularly if it's a different kind of book from most of your work, it does tend to take some of its brothers and sisters' thunder, uh, like a brilliant child who uh, in a class, uh, like Henry Dickens instead of Charles and, and, and Edward Dickens and all the other Dickens who were kind of dyslexic and couldn't, couldn't be students. Uh, it does t tend to take uh, the thunder of uh, of other uh, uh, from other books, but above all, it's fortunate and it's blessed. Now, Peter Carey described it as being hit by a bus. It <laughs> would be for Peter because he's kind of a fay man who would like to be recognised, but actually, the fuss of being recognised scares him. But I'm, uh, I find, for me, it was a velvet bus. And I was delighted I caught it that particular year. Oh, I, I think it was a velvet are, bus. It must have been a velvet bus for Peter since he's been knocked over by it twice. <laughs> yes, indeed. It, so it's five it, to tell the tale, both times. Yes. But uh, <laughs> Peter is not as... Uh, not as great an exhibitionist as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am an old Australian snake oil salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all the better for it. Um, Ellie, how about you? Well, I mean, the the impact on my career was profound, you know. Um, uh, I, I can identify with the being hit by a bus comment. You know, I was I was on the road for about two years after the Booker Prize, I think, just um, traveling with the book and um, uh, doing a lot of uh, press events and so on. And it was it was really amazing to travel with it and to see how how the book changed in different contexts. You know, to, to change depending on who was who was reading it and how they were slotting it into their own country's literature and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one thing that I, I did struggle with and that has informed uh, probably uh, the, the writing of my next book was feeling suddenly as though I was kind of wearing the uniform of my country <laughs> in a way, um, in, in, in a sense of um, uh, a advertising the book, I suppose, or um, uh, uh, re representing New Zealand as though I, I was a kind of some sort of a sports person, um, which is not at all how I would approach my writing um, ordinarily. And it was kind of a heavy responsibility to know what to do with and not really a responsibility that I think that authors um, should should necessarily have. <laughs> um, she, if, you if would be equivalent of the All Blacks, eh? 
<laughs> right. Would be the equivalent of the All Blacks. Yeah, well, I mean, but there's, there's, uh, yeah, very important differences, I suppose, you know, the, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but, but, but I think that, that that's ended up being quite interesting for me to grapple with. I think that my new book um, deals with the question of kind of New Zealand self-image and New Zealand self-exceptionalism and the kind of the pressure uh, that is that the, the country puts on itself to to kind of um, advertise itself to the world in a favorable light, even when unfavorable things maybe deserve to deserve to come to light. Um, yeah, so I think yes. that it, it it led me in an interesting direction, but it was um, it was an uncomfortable role to play at times. Yes, I can imagine. Actually, Damon Galgut recently said said um, you know he's obviously been traveling ever since he won that's six months or so not not two years yet um but he, he said it's okay it's all in it's all in a good cause and I thought he meant the cause of selling his book and I said is that is that what you mean and he said no I mean reading and actually I thought okay well if you did think that was the cause then mm. it would be worth it um but if it feels like you, you know you're sort of being bashed about by people's perceptions or even that you're marketing yourself or it, you know then then I think it, obviously you'd rather be writing or, or not writing or whatever it is just not doing that so I think it takes it does take up a lot of time and 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 certainly the idea that you would have to represent something rather than just getting on with writing your books must be very uncomfortable <laughs> yes um, yeah. my mother looked upon uh, reading as the redemption uh, as the way into an extra dimension and she was a girl from the bush uh, had to leave school at sixth grade to earn a living, but uh, formidable when it came to books. Mm. You could not, if you had a book, ever complain of being bored. She didn't allow it. <laughs> well, think of your character, Anna Wetherill, right, Ellie? <laughs> You know, <laughs> oh right, yeah. <laughs> Can't read, and then you know what that what that means. But well, anyway, thank you, yeah. thank you both very much. I think we've we've we could talk for hours, or I don't know. I, I suspect this it might have to be edited if we did that. Uh, <laughs> so I think we will close now, if that's all right, and and tell the rest of you um, to find out more about the Big Jubilee Read, as I said earlier, at bbc.co.uk/arts. Um, there's also a book from each of the decades being featured on BBC Two's Between the Covers, um, hosted by Sarah Cox. And you can catch up on iPlayer and do visit the Booker Prizes website, which is thebookerprizes.com um, for all sorts of in-depth interviews and uh, archival finds and analysis of the books um, that, that we've been speaking about. Um, and do, if you haven't read them yet, which I'm sure you have, but if you haven't, um, get them from your local library or bookshop. So thank you very much to Arts Council England for making this event possible. And thank you to you both, um, Thomas Keneally and Eleanor Catton. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you Eleanor. <laughs> it was great. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs>